music. I don't have it. <laughs> it's in the middle here. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. If you would open your Bibles to First Peter. First Peter. chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. We'll be jumping around a little bit, but uh, primarily here is where we'll be. Okay. Uh, starting at verse 13. Okay, wherefore gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and hope to the end. For the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lesson of your ignorance, uh, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation. Because it is written, Be ye holy, for I am holy. Okay, so much of what we're covering uh, the next two weeks, basically, uh, are going to be what Pastor covered in his separation series. It's kind of hard not to go over that. So it's going to be, it's going to seem kind of redundant in some way. Um, so we're speaking of separation. This is the last distinctive, uh, the last S in the acronym. And then um, it's going to be into th in three parts. But uh, the first two are kind of very related. And the second one's really kind of built on the first one. But we're looking at the first one today, which is personal. So personal, ecclesiastical, and civil. Okay, uh, separation. Now you ask, why is this a Baptist distinctive? What makes this unique or different uh, among other, I guess you could say, denominations or any other kind of like religious belief system? Why, why is separation unique to Baptists? No, mind you. Um, I don't think I emphasize this, but uh, we uh, would identify ourselves as Baptists, but really it would just be a Bible believer. What distinguishes someone that would be genuinely a Bible believer? Because historically, a uh, Baptist would have been just somebody that would have been a genuine Bible believer. And they wouldn't have been part of state church, or they would have, uh, even though you did have believers that would have come out from state church or from a mainline denomination, uh, there are born again folks uh, that come out of that. Uh, but what what distinguishes as far as why, why is that such a significant uh, trait or trademark of somebody that's a Bible believer? How does, how does that come about? Why is it unique? For, to, to Bible believers. Because you're unique up on it? <laughs> a good one. <laughs> Sorry, I've been taking lessons from Andrew. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, sir? <clears throat> For obeying scriptures that uh, tell us things not to do, uh, how not to appear. Yes, basically, it's going to, we're going to see this, okay? So, we're, that just kind of begs the question what is separation? So, uh, in contrast to most anybody else, somebody that's a, that's a Bible believer that's going to be um, desirous to want to be close to the Lord, to want to walk uh, a close relationship with Christ, to be Christ-like. Uh, this is something that is common throughout all of Scripture as far as it's not just unique to the New Testament or to Paul's writings or even to Peter's, but uh, you go back into the Old Testament and quite frequently, uh, especially not only when he called out um, well, he made promise to Abram, and then from there, 
you know, it wouldn't be like two generations later that he would have the 12, and then it wouldn't be until Moses that you really have the establishment of the law. But even in giving the law, uh, God had always basically predicated everything upon his character. Anything that he states as far as uh, law that's given, it's always, um, well, not just started, but also ended with the fact that he says, you know, I am the Lord. I am the Lord. I am the Lord. He gives command and he says, I am the Lord. And uh, this being one of them that we would find. Hi, good morning. That we would find. Yes, sir. Well, he said uh, in the Old Testament, the Jews were chosen, his chosen people. In First Peter, it says we're, we're, his, we're a chosen generation, uh, peculiar people, set apart. Peculiar being different. Yeah. Set apart for him. And set apart means holy. We are supposed to be separated. Yes. And so the thing is, is because God's, God's different, God's unique. He's not like anybody else. And so the thing is, we, we are called to be like him. Uh, so that, that's why, that's what makes it distinctive as far as... Uh, and we'll see here that the other two are going to be built, the civil and then the uh, ecclesiastic are going to be built on that. Okay, so separation. What is it? It's a call to personal holiness. It is also turning away from the world's influence, which really, that's in effect what personal holiness is. It's twofold. It's negative and positive. So the negative would be that you're turning away from the world's influence, but you're turning to God's influence in all aspects of my life. So in other words, I'm not just turning away from it, but I'm turning to something as well. All right, so you don't... Uh, we have, uh, I guess you could say, a lot of misconception with regard to the separation from the world. Um, you see this a lot with the... Well, you see this a lot, I guess, with, um, you could say, Mennonite or the Amish and things like that, where they're separate. Or even, if you even go into the Hasidic Jewish community, uh, they separate themselves, but they don't want, I'm sorry, we're in First Peter, First okay. Peter chapter 1. Okay. Uh, they separate themselves because they don't want to be contaminated, uh, but the fact is, they're not turning to anything. Uh, they're not, you know, the, we're called to be salt and light. And actually that, when Israel was supposed to be, when Israel was walking with the Lord, that's what their intent was. Uh, God's intent was for Israel to be a light to the nations mm -hmm. and that all the nations would come to him through through Israel. And well, this day and age, again, he hasn't done away with Israel. He set them aside temporarily uh, and the church is not Israel, but he's still the same God. His character hasn't changed and so he still has the same call and the same desire as that uh, through the church, uh, which is... Jew and Gentile now come together that he, with our personal holiness and distinctiveness, uh, would he would draw out from the world those that uh, want to want to come to know him. Okay, so you have the turning away from world's influence, and then you have turning to God's influence in all aspects of my life. And ultimately, we see this in Philippians. Uh, it's the pursuit of Christ likeness. Okay, we're in, we're told in Romans that uh, we're predestined to be conformed to the image of Christ, mm -hmm. and that that is same. Romans eight twenty nine. Yes, yes, sir. Favorite verse. <laughs> and then we are also uh, commanded, really, in effect, to, to pursue that, uh, setting our affection on things above, not on things of this earth, and and such. But separation really is it's Christ like. Now this is on a personal level. The ecclesiastical and the civil kind of build upon that, and there's enough difference there that but it's, it's still founded and based on this, on the fact that we're supposed to be Christ-like. And then, obviously, it's a command to be obeyed. We've just seen this here in First Peter, that Peter writes to the scattered abroad, primarily Jewish believers, but he's writing to all believers, and this was supposed to be circulated among all believers. Now, he was writing to the ones in Galatia primarily, but as well just all, all throughout as far as the believers during his prior time when he was still alive. Uh, and then he would write a second epistle to them. But in this, he, he says, just very bluntly, uh, Be holy, for I am holy, saith the Lord. In other words, God commanded holiness of his people because he's holy. And the idea there is this, because we carry his name upon us. In other words, we... Uh, not only have been called by his name, uh, but 
you know, we, we're, rep, we're ambassadors, as we're told in Second Corinthians. Uh, and as representatives of the Lord Jesus, as representatives of the God of heaven, uh, if he's holy, then we obviously must by default be holy as well. Now, he has <clears throat> sanctified us with regard to um, our, our nature. He's given us a new nature. When we got born again, uh, we received the Holy Spirit of promise. Uh, we are sealed until the day of redemption. And then he's translated us from the kingdom of darkness unto light. And as well, uh, he's input new desires into our hearts. And the thing is, that's only manifest as we yield ourselves to that, as we yield ourselves and submit ourselves to the Holy Spirit's leading as we yield ourselves uh, we're told in Philippians that it is God worketh in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So he gives desire, and he actually gives ability to be able to fulfill that desire. But it's only as we yield, as we submit ourselves, as we say, yes, Lord, that we can go for it. And actually that's going to be manifest in our life. So we have a personal responsibility here. Uh, it's not automatic. Okay, Now, God does his part, obviously, but then our responsibility our part is to obey to yield uh, the trust and as we step forward in that uh, that's more going to be manifest and we'll see more of Christ's character manifest in us and uh, not not in our you know not not us ourselves so first off the word holy itself uh, this is the Hebrew word Kadesh and the meaning of it, apartness, holiness, sacredness, separateness, apartness, you know. Uh, <clears throat> in other words, it's something that you set apart. It's also, a, it has a very uh, root to, to basically a cut. So that picture is basic. I, I don't know if you can tell. It's a handle of a knife, and then there's somebody splitting the root of the knife. But uh, normally you do it with like an ax or a heavier implement to be able to cut. Um, but that's that's the root of it of holiness. Holy is just a, like a cut a separateness, and then uh, that would be for the Hebrew word for it. And then in uh, Greek, hagias is the term or the word that's used. And then most holy thing, a saint. Okay, it's, as a noun, it's also meant as far as a saint, a saint, which is a sanctified person. Uh, normally, most people think of saints as what they think in the Catholic Church. Uh, somebody that did really neat things or whatnot. And I, I honestly don't even really know the process as far as how they get elected to that. Uh, as far as, but usually it's after they're dead. Uh, <coughs> you would think of somebody like a Mother Teresa or something like that, that they gave their life to uh, live in poverty. Uh, to serve orphans and that kind of thing, and then all of a sudden, after they're dead, however many years, then they take a vote on them and they say, okay, this person's considered a saint. Uh, but the truth is that anybody that is born again, anybody who receives Christ, regardless of whether they're you know five years old or they're you know 90 years old, uh, the fact is that person, at the moment that they receive Christ, uh, they become a sanctified one. They're set apart. And the reason why is because they receive Christ. Uh, they receive the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, God separates them. He takes them into his family, translates them from the kingdom of darkness uh, unto light. And so they are uh, they're holy. Uh, even though uh, it may not seem like to us, uh, you know, Scripture tells us that uh, man looketh on the outward, but God looketh upon the heart. So he knows what's going on inside. And though um, in Romans 6, this is best clarified. Uh, there's other portions of Scripture that deal with this subject as well. But um, what we have become because of accepting Christ uh, may not be manifest yet. But as we yield it ourselves is where, where that's going to be manifest. Uh, so uh, we have a responsibility to live in accordance with what we've been called So, what was that last slide there, that last phrase you had on that last slide? 
Oh, that's an um, awful thing. Theological. Uh, Left error. Okay. okay. Origin from an awful thing, and then theological th uh, dictionary of the New Testament. That's the entry for it. I could show you guys afterwards because I don't have a way to be able to go ahead and put it up over here, but um, I got a Bible program called Bible Words, and then usually what I do is if that's where I do all my original language stuff. Okay. I scroll over, and then it's got automatically all the resources on my on my on the right to the screen there when I have it. And then uh, well, it'd be awful in terms of full of awe, not the way we use awful today. Yes, that's something that's also the same living as far as where like it's terrible. Mm -hmm. A lot of times where we would read. Like it's inspiring terror. Like, well, okay, well, but it's not really something as far as that it's bad. It's not negative. It's something that is causing. Well, we see the responses uh, in Isaiah six. Isaiah, when he saw the Lord high and lifted up, his train filled the temple, and then uh, you know the smoke and the glory and the angels crying out, "Holy, holy, holy!" Uh, his response <coughs> was, "Oh, woe is me." <laughs> okay. Uh, Apostle John in Revelation chapter 1. Um, now, mind you, this is towards the end of Apostle John's life, but nonetheless, uh, he was somebody that he saw Christ transfigured before him, before Christ died, right? Uh, he was the one that uh, beat Peter to the tomb whenever they were racing, uh, when they heard that, hey, you know, Christ is risen, his body's not here. Uh, so him and Peter ran, and then he beat Peter to the tomb, and then Peter was right behind him. Uh, he was the one that he wrote of himself. Now, mind you, this is under inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but he wrote of himself that he says, you know, on the uh, the disciple whom Jesus loved. You know, he leaned upon <coughs> Jesus' breast. He was one of them. He actually was there uh, and didn't flee, and he was entrusted with care of Mary, uh, the mother, you know, Christ's mother. Um, he said, you know, when Christ was on the cross, and he says, okay, you know, uh, woman, behold thy son, and the son, behold thy woman. And so this, you know, he was one of the ones that had, I guess you could say, the closest relationship to Christ while Christ was still here. And even following, um, you don't see that he was one that would have, like, fallen away or that we read about uh, that, like, uh, I guess it really had any negative, negative aspect to him as far as in his walk with Christ. Uh, even following, uh, like we see with Peter, um, Nonetheless, that when he's on the Lord's Day and he's worshiping the Lord on uh, Isle of Patmos in his exile, he hears this thundering voice, and then he turns and he sees uh, <coughs> bright raiment, uh, his feet as if they were uh, burnt brass, and then uh, he, he basically sees Christ in his glory. And then his response is he falls at his feet like a dead man. That's, that's like, wow, okay, wait a minute. You know, you would think, you'd be like, wow, you'd be rejoicing, you know, like you did whenever, uh, you know, they're, they're off fishing, uh, following the resurrection, but they didn't see the body yet. And then, uh, you know, Christ is at the shore. He calls to them, hey, children. And then he says, hey, it's the Lord. So he jumps into the water and goes swims towards him, you know. But he sees him in his glory. Now, it's not like he hadn't seen him before in his glory, but... You know, you've seen him in his glory, and this is, he's already, this is many years following the fact that he's already spent those 40 days prior to Pentecost being taught by the Lord following the resurrection, and he says, okay, he falls at his feet like a dead man. <laughs> that's his response. Okay, that's awful. Like, in all, that's an awe-inspiring thing. That's, that's going to be the natural response, you know, what was me. Okay, so... With keeping with the outline uh, that I initially gave at the beginning, um, okay, so what is holiness? Okay, uh, it's or what is separation? So it's a call to personal holiness, uh, and the reason why is because First Peter here we're told that be ye holy for I am holy. Okay, uh, be ye holy for I am holy. In other words, it's it's a command to be obeyed as well. Uh, we have God's name on us. Um, we have the responsibility to basically represent Christ, to represent God Almighty, 
while here up until either he returns or uh, you know we're taken home. And so if Christ is holy, then we are to be holy as well. Uh, turn to First John. We've already read part of it here, but First John chapter two. First John chapter two. Beyond that, this is the negative aspect. Okay, it's a turning from the world. It's a turning from the world. <laughs> Turning from the world. First John chapter two, and then verse fifteen. We're told, uh, "Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man, uh, if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him." And then verse sixteen. Uh, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Okay, now this is just a direct command. Straight up, just love not the world. Reason being is, we're told here, uh, it's not congruent with God's character. Okay? And plus, it's anti. It's anti God's character. We're told in verse 16, the things that are in the world, uh, you know, they're not of the Father. So, and here is the breakdown of it. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and then the pride of life. <coughs> Any of those things that would influence my life are going to keep me focused on things that basically don't have any kind of eternal value to them. Um, we're called to a different life as a believer. Now, there's not, that's not to mean that we don't have any kind of uh, benefit here and now, but ultimately the thing is we're supposed to be seeking to uh, live a life that has eternal purpose and eternal value to it. That's actually what we're called to do. Uh, that was our actual original intent when God created us. Uh, in everything that God had done when we read uh, first three chapters, well actually first two chapters of Genesis, uh, starting going into chapter three, but um, everything that God created glorified him. And we would have been of his creation. But nonetheless, uh, our intent, our original intent was obviously worshiping God, serving God, but glorifying him. Uh, so we're making him known as for who he is. Now that is marred and diminished uh, when Adam sinned and then following, you know, because now sin puts the focus on us or anything else other than God. Uh, and then so it takes what we, what we see of, of beauty and then it, it, it just mars it. Uh, so God, in order to restore that, uh, well, in part because also he loves us, which is a major part. Uh, the fact is, you know, he came down and sacrificed himself and then uh, he rose again from the dead. So now we can be restored to what we should be. And that is to, to glorify God, uh, to fulfill our original purpose. Uh, go to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew 6. Verse 19, Matthew 6, starting at verse 19. Okay, Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth, where moth and rust doth corrupt, and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, uh, where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt, and where thieves do not break through nor steal. <coughs> where your treasure is, uh, there where your heart be also. Okay, the lot of body is the eye. If Thine eye be single, thine whole body shall be full of light. But if thine eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore that light, or the light that is in thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? And then no man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. Now you cannot serve God and mammon. And then he's going to go through, if we were to read, and he's going to give explanation with regard to that. But we're told here to uh, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven and then not in earth. So he makes a distinction here 
and he shows us it's possible to, one, have heavenly treasure stored, and then also as well that um, there's a distinction. I, 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 this is, I know, common sense, so I'm not trying to insult anybody's intelligence, but like, okay, you have that which is heavenly, which has greater value than that which is earthly. Uh, we see the same thing repeated, uh, or same concept in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 3. You can turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Verse 9, okay, for we are laborers together with God, we are God's husbandry, we are God's building. According to the grace of God, which is given unto me as a wise master builder, I have laid the foundation, and another man buildeth thereupon, thereon. But let every man take heed how he buildeth thereon, or thereupon. For other foundation can no man lay that is laid, which is Christ Jesus. Okay, now if any man build upon this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble. Every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, uh, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, uh, yet so as by fire. Okay, so this is a similar concept about... Uh, storing treasure in heaven as opposed to storing treasure on earth. Uh, and this is a silly question, but is that saying that you can't uh, be fruitful on earth? Like in other words, you can't have money? Is it saying that you can't have nice things? Or uh, even then that you can't be stewarded, uh, allotted, you know, financial wealth and that kind of stuff? No. Is there anything wrong with that? No. It, it's really, honestly, it's being governed by it. It's the love of money that uh, is the root of all evil, not money itself, but rather the love of it. So you can have a poor person that, that has nothing, uh, you know, living out on the street could be as covetous uh, and uh, filled with that desire for money, um, just as wicked as somebody that is living riotously, that may have, you know, all kind of substance and gives no regard to God. So it's not the substance itself, it's rather the desire, uh, the heart behind it. So here we're told, in particular, that we can build upon a foundation. Now, the foundation is Christ, obviously, but so uh, what's the building that we do? Yes, sir. It's the, the works that we do, whether it's by faith or in the flesh. Yes. Yes, so it's faithful works. And... If we were to read, we don't see it just exclusively with Paul, but we do see it a lot in Paul's writings, uh, that he says that we're to be mindful of good works. Now, I know that seems kind of like, okay, what is good works then? <laughs> Anything that's good. Honestly, it's like, he doesn't give a parameter as to, you know. Whatsoever is not of faith is sin. Yeah. We, we, did, we, could, we could be teaching Sunday school in the flesh. I'm, I'm not pointing at you. <laughs> no, no, I know. I know. I'm saying, <laughs> yeah. Uh, giving a cup of cold water in his name is just as much something that could be faith filled. You know, you, anything that you would read in scripture that would be like, hey, wow, you're convicted about that I need to obey, go and seek to fulfill it, obey. Uh, it's, it's a good work. Uh, and obviously, the motive would be that you're pointing to Christ. It's supposed to be that Christ is supposed to be exalted, and it's pointing people to him. Um, and so that, that would be uh, what would motivate us. But ultimately the fact is it's like, okay, hey, we can build uh, things and we can actually have some treasure in heaven. Um, now, that which is not going to last, stuff that, wrong motive primarily, uh, but as well, hey, just working in the flesh, uh, building things that are of earthly focus. He may, he's going to make, there's, well, there's going to be a distinction made. We'll see that. 
uh, go to Colossians, Colossians chapter 3, Colossians 3. Colossians 3. And then from there we're going to go to Philippians. Okay, Colossians 3. Um, if ye then be risen with Christ, seek those things which are above, which Christ, or excuse me, where Christ sitteth on the right hand of God. Set your affections on things above, not on things of the earth, or not on things on the earth. For ye are dead, and your life is hid with Christ and God. And then when Christ, who is our life, shall appear, then ye shall also appear with him in glory. And then he's going to give command here that almost parallels uh, Ephesians, end of chapter 4 going into chapter 5, as far as the things that, as far as how we're supposed to live here now practically. Um, but here's the foundational mindset is that uh, because we're risen with Christ, the, the idea of there is, uh, if, if you be risen with Christ, <coughs> because we are risen with Christ, uh, we should seek those things that are above, and then we're supposed to set our affections on things above and not on things of the earth. The reason why is because we're dead. We're dead to sin. Uh, I'm freed from bondage to obey, you know, the, the devil or any of his minions. I'm no longer bound to the lust of my flesh. Okay? I, it is possible for me to fight them. It is possible for me to have victory in my life uh, on a daily basis, on a continually, continual daily basis. Um, I don't have to, you know, obey wrong. I can't. I can't actually do right. It is possible for me to do right. And so, because of that, because we have that freedom, because we have that opportunity, we have that privilege, uh, and, and we're commanded, hey, set your thing, set your affections on things above. Um, the reason why? Well, that's eternal. What's here is temporal. Um, even if you were to spend your life on things, uh, how long is you know lifespan for most humans nowadays? I should say. 78, 80? On average, yeah. There's, I mean, you got a few exceptions. Um, we see a little bit more here in the U.S. than you see in any other country. Uh, there's a couple that I read about that is celebrating 82 years of married. Okay. <laughs> I'm like, wait a minute, how long did they get, how long ago did they get married? Uh, the husband is 103, and then the wife is 100. You know, they live out in Charlotte. And then, uh, but 82, wow, it's like, that's a really long life. You know, how much longer do you think they have? I, I'm not trying to be morbid, but I'm just saying. Still, the fact is, that's still a drop in a bucket compared to what eternity is. Um, you know, I, I personally desire a long life. <laughs> I'll never be able to, you know, match that goal, but still, that's pretty cool. That's pretty neat. Uh, and the fact is, even, I don't know if they're believers. If they are, and we were to interview them, and you'd say, okay, hey, how much of your life was spent for Christ? You know, I would, I would, well, I don't know. I could say how much of it was. But even then, you know, you think you could have spent more for him. You think you could have expended more or focused more of your attention on things above. I would venture to say if they're walking the spirit, there would be somebody that would be like, yeah, I could have spent a whole lot more of my time or more of my life focused on serving the Lord. Um, Okay, so setting our affections on things above and not on things of this earth. Uh, go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Starting in verse 13. Okay, brethren, I count not, my, I count not myself to have apprehended, uh, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind, and then reaching forth unto those things which are before. Uh, verse 14, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And then here's the admonition. Let us therefore, as many as be perfect, be thus minded, and if any 
If in anything you be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even this unto you. Okay, now, perfect. The idea there is not like you're without sin, that you have nothing to improve upon, but rather you're fit for where you should be. Uh, in other words, it's, a, it's, a, it's like a fitness term. It's, not, it's you're mature. Uh, but, um, like, if you, well, if you see somebody that's like 55 years old that wearing a bib, like a diaper, what would you think? Yeah, it's, this is not right. There's something wrong with it. Um, you know, do you <laughs> do you see like uh, a two-year-old? Oh, well, I'm, I know they could be dressed up, but I'm saying like, okay, do you see them speaking in perfect English? No, you'd see okay, it's something that's not right. Depending on how advanced, you know, I don't. I actually don't know how far along they should be, but you know, I would assume they would probably be walking and learning to speak and those kinds of things. So his level of fitness for his age is going to be different than somebody that would be 55. Nevertheless, they could both be fit. And so they would have an appropriate level of what would be fit for them for that age. Okay, so for your level of maturity, if you're mature, okay, that's the perfect here. Let us be thus minded. And the thus minded is referring back to verse 14, that you press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now, what is that? What's that high calling? What's the mark? What's that prize of the high calling? Yeah, it's Christ likeness, actually. Okay, so the idea that it's not stated outright, but it's understood is that it's Christ likeness. Or as I, you mentioned it earlier, to be conformed to the image of His Son. Yeah, yeah. So that's 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 what our prize is. That's what we should be pursuing and seeking uh, daily. And then he says here that we should be thus minded. Uh, here's, he, he gives explanation why. Uh, verse 16, nevertheless, whereunto we have already attained, let us walk by the same rule, let us mind the same thing. Uh, and then, brethren, be followers together of me, and mark them which walk so as ye have us for an example. Uh, and here's why it says, for many walk of whom I have told you often, and now tell you, even weeping, that they are the enemies of the cross of Christ. Okay, so what's who are these enemies? Let's, we're going to read the description here. It's in verse 19. Whose end is destruction, whose God is their belly, and whose glory is in their shame. And here's the synopsis of them. Who mind earthly things. So you could say a person that's earthly minded is the end of them is going to be destruction. In other words, it's ruin, it's waste. Okay, it doesn't mean, okay, that they're going to lose their salvation. He's speaking of believers here. He's referencing believers that you know, they have a wasted life. Uh, whose God is their belly? So fellesly appetites is what governs them. And then whose glory is in their shame? The things that they would be proud about and that they would be glorying in are actually shameful. Okay? As far as Christ considers them shameful. So they don't have anything really to glory in because it's shameful. Even though they might value it, God doesn't value it. And then God's assessment of them is that they're enemies of the cross of Christ. Why? Because Christ freed us from that. That's what the cross is. It's freedom from, from, from bondage. But rather they want to keep continuing in that. Um, so we're called to be different. We're called to be different. Uh, so do we have any questions? Okay, if not, we're going to be looking at ecclesiastical next week, and then after that, civil. Uh, I'll see if I can combine the two. Uh, if not, we're dismissed. Or if you do have any questions, you can come to me afterwards. We're dismissed now. Thank you.